All right. I want to have some time for questions, but um, I also told you on yesterday that we would address um, these issues of um, sexual ethics um, in our culture, and particularly this um, whole idea of um, same-sex marriage, homosexuality. Um, and I want to do that from the same kind of expository apologetic approach. Um, one of the things that, uh, that is very common, um, this movement, this, the homosexual movement has been very well organized um, and very aggressive in our culture um, and very shrewd. And when, when, things, when things work, um, they have a tendency to continue to press there. And one of the things that has been quote, working for them is this whole idea of, uh, of hypocrisy um, and some version of the question, why do you pick and choose? Um, there was a, an episode of The West Wing um, that aired uh, several years ago, in the early 2000s, and there was a, a character on the show um, who was a representative of Dr. Laura Schlesinger. And um, the president in this famous scene um, just sort of eviscerates her, you know, during an encounter there in the Oval Office. And, you know, it's kind of one of these things where, you know, hey, you're the one who has the radio program and, you know, you say that you know, homosexuality is an abomination. I got some questions for you, you know. Uh, you're not supposed to touch the skin of a dead pig, um, if the Redskins wear gloves, can they still play football, you know? Um, you know, not supposed to, you know, put two different kinds of, you know, material together. And if this happens and that happens, da da da, da. You know, I want to sell my daughter. Um, she's a senior at Georgetown, speaks fluent Italian. It wouldn't be a good price for her. You know, and, and, and all these sort of, the whole idea is this kind of, you're a hypocrite because there are these laws that you quote unquote ignore, but this one statement about homosexuality as an abomination, you try to uphold. Um, later on in 2008, if you remember in 2008, this, this was a sort of watershed moment. Um, Proposition 8 in California. Uh, was up for a vote. And it's interesting because California was a place where the homosexual movement felt like it had a foothold. And basically, if they couldn't win there, they weren't going to win anywhere. And so they brought out all the big guns. Um, Jack Black did uh, a parody. And in this parody, it was a short musical number where he you know, played Jesus and they had these people who were, you know, the religious bigots and, you know, and then there were other people in the crowd and, you know, and the religious bigots were, you know, were on the, you know, no to Proposition 8 side. And they were saying, well, it's an abomination. And, you know, Jack Black dressed as Jesus comes out and he goes, well, yeah, well, so is this shrimp I'm eating. And, you know, da, da, da. It, it was the same. The parody was all about the same question. Why do you pick and choose? You're hypocrites because you pick and choose. When you see things like that repeated, you know they have traction and they're being used again and again and again. And so many Christians can't answer the question. Well, I, I want to help you answer that question. Um, and I want to tell you, I rely heavily on Leviticus 18.22 when discussing the homosexuality issue. Not because I believe that Leviticus 18.22 is the best passage necessarily for us to make our argument. But I want to invite this accusation of hypocrisy. I, I want the discussion to go there. I want people to accuse me of hypocrisy and, and ask me the why you pick and choose question because I think it's a powerful opportunity for us. First of all, because it, it, they're going to use it. It's out there. It's in the water, right? It's been successful. They're waiting for an opportunity to use it. And so you get to bait them, right? And so Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male 
as with a female, it is an abomination. You shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal and lie with it. It is a perversion. And so it's clear here. Homosexuality is an abomination. And, I, you know, I, I bring that up. I bring up, you know, in Leviticus 18, we see that, you know, lying with a male is with a female. God calls it an abomination. And people just kind of go, I mean, they just they get giddy because they're like, what? He just went there. He just went there, you know. And I'm like, yeah, but what about this law or what about that law or what about the other law? Essentially, why do you get to pick and choose? I want them to ask me that question because I want to answer that question. Not just because it helps me to win an argument, but it helps me to get to the gospel. And that's where I want to go. Okay? So, why do we pick and choose? First, before answering the question, here's what you have to do. You must destroy the moral high horse. Because they think they're on the moral high ground. You just brought up homosexuality being an abomination. They just trumped you. They played their trump card. You're actually a hypocrite. Because there's a whole lot of other stuff in Leviticus that you're not holding to, but you want to run there and hold to this abomination thing. You are a hypocrite because you pick and choose. First thing you do is destroy the moral high horse. What's step one? Destroy the moral high horse. How do you destroy the moral high horse? By pointing out that everybody picks and chooses. Everybody picks and chooses. And if you have your Bible, I mean, you can even do it. I have my Bible. I have some things marked up here. Like, if you don't mind, can I, can I just show you a couple things? Um, Leviticus 19, verse 11. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You believe those things are wrong too, right? In fact, you also obviously believe hypocrisy is wrong, right? Because you're saying that I'm being a hypocrite, and that's wrong, that that's immoral for me to be a hypocrite. So you're judging me for being a hypocrite, and you also think that lying is wrong and stealing is wrong, and those things are found in Leviticus 19. So you don't agree with me on Leviticus 18.22, but you do agree with me on Leviticus 19.11, which means you also pick and choose. So first, let's destroy the moral high horse. All of us pick and choose. Now, at this point, there will be hue and cry and objection. And basically, the objection is going to be, no, I, I, may, not, I may agree with those things, but not because they're there in Leviticus. At which point, we make it clear, actually, you do hold to those things because they're in Leviticus. You didn't just make those things up. These things were passed down to you, and they've been around since Leviticus. So since they've been around since Leviticus, and they didn't just come to you magically, whether you know it or not, or whether you admit it or not, you're holding to things that God put in his word and that he put in the heart of man. So you don't have to admit that you're picking and choosing. I'm telling you that you pick and choose. I'm telling you that there are parts of the Levitical law that you hold to. Not just that. Look at the next one. Look down here at verse 13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. Look over later on. Verse 15. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. You shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. Again, all of these things people would uphold and people would agree with, and they're in Leviticus. Now, I don't agree with them because they're in Leviticus, but you do agree with them. So I can read things from Leviticus 
to which you go, yeah. And I can read other things from Leviticus to which you go, no. Which means you pick and choose. So that's step number one. Let's destroy the moral high horse. Let's establish the fact that you are not morally superior to me in this argument. Because you pointed out what you believe to be hypocrisy. Step number one is a very important step. Because again, these people haven't examined this. They don't understand this. They've never been here before. They think that they've pointed something out that puts you, you know, behind the eight ball. You're in trouble. And literally they believe that they're morally superior to you. You point out the fact that they're not. And then you remind them. By the way, I'm not saying I'm morally superior to you either. Uh, I'm not. We both pick and choose. But there's a difference between us. I know why I pick and choose. Not only do you not know why you pick and choose, before I just showed you, you didn't know that you pick and choose. Amen? In fact, you're still trying to argue that you're picking and choosing is not picking and choosing, but my picking and choosing is picking and choosing because I know when you don't, right? The fact of the matter is you do pick and choose. And the fact that you're not willing to own it, again, means you don't know why. You agree with this in Leviticus, but not that in Leviticus, and you don't know why. And your only response is some sort of internal morality that you believe allows you to pick and choose. And there's the difference between you and me. You trust your internal morality. I don't trust mine. Because I know I'm a sinner. And I know I'm in need of a savior. I know I'm not righteous. I know that there is nothing in me that is morally superior. So I would not dare open the book of Leviticus and just trust my heart to know what I should believe, what I should hold to, what I shouldn't hold to, what things should stand, what things should not. I don't trust me for that because I do not believe in my moral superiority. That's the difference between you and me. You think you're morally superior, I think God is. That's the difference. Now that we've established that, if you don't mind, let me explain to you why I pick and choose. Number one, I pick and choose because not all the laws in Leviticus are the same. I pick and choose because not all the laws in Leviticus are the same. There are three types of law in Leviticus. Moral laws, civil laws, and ceremonial laws. And you can see them, for example, right here. Um, for example, in verse 11, that's a, that's a moral law. You shall not steal. But if you back up some and go to chapter 19, verse 5, when you offer a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. Well, that's a ceremonial law, right? That's a ceremonial law. If you go back over to the one that we read earlier about court, that would be a civil law. So there are three types of laws in Leviticus. There's one type of law in Leviticus that's a civil law, and it has to do with the way that Israel governed itself in the ancient Near East. Those laws may inform me of moral truths, but I don't just bring them over like a one-to-one -one equivalent because we're not Israel and we're not in the ancient Near East, which means it is incumbent upon me to pick and choose in that regard. Secondly, there are ceremonial laws. Some of the ceremonial laws involve sacrifice in the temple. Temple's not even there anymore. 
which means that it is incumbent upon me to pick and choose as it relates to the ceremonial laws. There are other laws, however, that are moral laws, and those laws stand for all time and relate to all people, and I don't get to not choose the moral law. So step number one, we crush the moral high horse. Step number two, we inform them that there is actually a theological and hermeneutical reason to follow some laws in Leviticus and not other laws in Leviticus, which means that picking and choosing is responsible not hypocritical. It's responsible, not hypocritical. We all do it. It's necessary to do it. There's a way to do it, and it's responsible to do it if you do it the right way. If you do it the right way. Well, why else do we pick and choose? And here's where we get to the heart of the matter, and here's where we get to the gospel. You see, if you turn over, for example, go to the New Testament, go to the book of Hebrews. For since the law, verse 10, chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of those realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and in sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices, and offerings, and burnt offerings, and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Which means, if I pick and choose to follow the ceremonial laws of of Leviticus, I am actually negating and blaspheming the once for all finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, I pick and choose because as a Christian, I have to. 
I pick and choose because the ceremonial laws prefigured and pointed forward to the work that Christ would accomplish on the cross. The ceremonial laws were a foreshadowing of the finished work that Christ would do. The ceremonial laws merely pointed forward to how God would do away with sin by crushing and killing his own son who would die for sin once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us back to God. Which means that as a Christian, I'm forced to pick and choose because Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Do you see what we just did? It's like a boxer coming in, putting his left hand down just a little bit low to invite that right. Because I know I'm faster than you. And I know that by the time you flinch that shoulder to throw that right hand, I'm going to bury my jab in your nose. So you mentioned Leviticus 18. And then they go, (laughs) Really, that's kind of hypocritical, right? You're picking and choosing. Well, first of all, you're calling me a hypocrite. I'm actually, yes, I am a hypocrite, but not because of what you think. We can talk about my hypocrisy later if you want to, but that's not hypocrisy. First of all, it's not hypocrisy because all of us pick and choose. Well, what do you mean we all pick and choose? Well, here's some things that you find in Leviticus 19 that you shouldn't steal. That you shouldn't bear false witness in court. You believe that, right? Well, yeah, everybody does. Oh, okay, fine. But the fact of the matter is, you choose to believe some things from Leviticus and to not believe other things from Leviticus, which means you, just like me, pick and choose. Here's the difference. You didn't even know you pick and choose. I know why I pick and choose. I pick and choose because there's three different kinds of law in Leviticus. There's moral law, there's civil law, and there's ceremonial law. There's the civil law that applied to Israel in the ancient Near East. There are moral realities that underlie those laws, and those moral realities will stand the test of time. However, those civil laws can't just be brought over on a one-to-one basis, so you have to pick and choose there. There are ceremonial laws in Leviticus, and these ceremonial laws point forward to the work that Christ will do on the cross, which leads me to the third reason that I have to pick and choose. I'm a Christian. And I understand that Christ is the fulfillment of the law, that the law pointed to the person and work of Christ, that Christ died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us back to God. Therefore, it would be blasphemy for me to hold to certain ceremonial laws in Leviticus because it would be like crucifying the Son of God all over again, which means that it's not hypocritical, but absolutely necessary for me to pick and choose. But as I've said before, there are those moral laws, those laws that stand for all people in all places at all times. And I do not have the right to choose anything other than those moral laws. Which brings me to the last reason that I pick and choose. Because as a hypocrite who recognizes his need for a savior, it would be more hypocritical for me having found this savior to not present him to you. So I point out the immorality of homosexuality, not because I believe that I'm superior to the homosexual, but I point it out because I'm just one beggar telling other beggars where I found bread. I'd be a hypocrite to know that this is a violation of God's moral law and that there is hope in Christ and in Christ alone and to not do everything in my power to present this hope to you. So yes, I do. Yes, I do pick and choose. I know how to pick and choose. I know why to pick and choose. I know when to pick and choose. 
I know that I have to pick and choose because there are three different types of law in Leviticus. I know that I have to pick and choose because the ceremonial law has been fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. And I know that when I pick and choose, it's not hypocrisy. But here's my question to you. Now that you know you pick and choose, can you tell me why? Can you tell me that you actually believe that you have moral righteousness residing in you that gives you the audacity to sit there and tell me that in and of yourself, you know what's right and you know what's wrong, independent of anyone or anything else? Can you tell me that you actually think that highly of yourself? Or is it possible that you need a moral compass that's outside of you? Perhaps one to teach you what to pick, what to choose, when to choose, and why to choose. Because you're incapable of doing so on your own. Folks, this is expository apologetics. This is answering people's objections with the power of the word. This is getting right down in there into an issue of our day that's not going anywhere. Same-sex marriage is the 900-pound gorilla in the American culture. And here's the irony. People think that the 900-pound gorilla is now satisfied. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because you see, the 900-pound gorilla made an argument, and here was his argument. His argument was that sexual orientation is equivalent to ethnicity. And that because sexual orientation is equivalent to ethnicity, for you to discriminate against me on the basis of my sexual orientation is tantamount to discriminating against someone because of their ethnicity. Which means that we must treat sexual orientation the same way we treat ethnicity in the law. That's the argument, folks. And the courts have said, you are right. Guess what that means? That the church must be treated the exact same way that it would be if it said no to someone because of their ethnicity. If they're not, then we're not treating sexual orientation the same way. Which means that the 900-pound gorilla will not be satisfied until the church is put in its place. And what that means is you will accept homosexuality. You will except same-sex marriage. You will celebrate same-sex marriage. You will perform same-sex marriages or the 900-pound gorilla will destroy you and you will not exist in this culture anymore. That's the next step. Don't think for a minute that these so-called religious exceptions will continue to stand. Logically, they can't. One plus one equals two. They can tell you it's four all day long. That's what they're doing right now. One plus one. And we're going, wait a minute, one plus one, that's going to equal two. In other words, one, this thing is the same thing as ethnicity, plus one, which means that ultimately you're going to have to enforce it the same way you would. That's two. One plus one equals two. Oh, no, 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 religious exceptions. One plus one equals four, man. It's all good. You're fine. One plus one equals four. Today. Today. But eventually the 900 pound gorilla is going to stand up and say, you fool. You thought we meant what we said? You really believe that we could make one plus one equal four? You really believe that? (laughs) You're an idiot. And now the moment of your destruction has arrived. That's what's coming, folks. 
that's what's next. It follows as inexorably as night follows day. And it all started with winning in the marketplace of ideas. This is why, for those of you, you know, who are around my age and you have children and you have grandchildren, your children and your grandchildren don't agree with you on this issue. They've been co-opted by the culture. They believe that the only evil people in the culture are people who have the audacity to call homosexuality a sin. This is where your children and your grandchildren are. This is what the school system has pounded into their brains day after day after day. This is what they believe, and this is how they vote. And this is how we've gotten into this situation. Well, it may take a while to do something about all that. But in the meantime, here's what I know. There are people out there who are ready and willing to engage and be engaged on this issue because they think they have the moral high ground. They can't wait for you to expose yourself as a Christian because they know that they can shame you and that the power of the entire culture is behind them on this. They want you to be exposed. They want to be able to say, oh, really? You pick and choose. How come you do this from Leviticus, but not that from Leviticus? And what you're supposed to do is put your tail between your legs and say, well, 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 well I don't know. I hope today you recognize that that doesn't have to be your response. I hope you also recognize that your response is not just about winning the argument, but it is about leveraging the argument to get to the gospel. Because the fact of the matter is, if I win an argument on homosexuality, but don't get to the gospel, I've wasted my time. Amen? Amen? All right. We'll stop here. I'll stop there so that we can have some quest- time for you to ask some questions. All right. Um, all right. We got a few minutes for that. Ready? Go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, um, the Bible doesn't look at all sins equally. Um, the, the worry is not the same as adultery. Both of them are sin, but the Bible doesn't look at them equally. Um, and, and when you read phrases even from the mouth of Jesus, like, be worse for you, da 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 um, they're, they're, they're not all uh, looked at equally. Not all sins are called abomination, um, you know, um, and, and homosexuality is a unique sin. Um, it's a very unique sin. It's unique sin in that it's one of the few sins to be referred to as an abomination. Um, it's uh, the only sin for which we've ever seen fire and brimstone rain down from heaven and destroy cities. Um, and, and it's unique in its heinousness in confronting and being an affront to the very nature of God and the very nature of man. Um, it's also unique um, in, in the in the personal consequences that we see from it. Um, It's unique again in that it is uh, one of the only sins that we've ever seen 
um, in, in recent times to have a lobby, you know, um, that, you know, that to openly uh, press uh, for its acceptance. Um, there are others that are following suit. But um, so, yeah, I think it I think it's it's problematic that we are sort of backing away from um, the, the uniqueness of this sin um, and it's and it, especially in its consequences, because there is there's a lot that's that's unique about it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's I think it's problematic. Um, and I think that's part of a strategy. Uh, there's a book. And again, for those of you who have the Semper Reformanda, I talk a great deal about this. Uh, there's a book called After the Ball. The subtitle is How America Will Overcome Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the Decade of the 90s. It was published in 1989. The two Harvard professors, Russell Kirk and Hunter Madsen, um, one a professor of psychology and the other one a professor of marketing. Um, there was a meeting that happened in 1988 for, with uh, some leading homosexual activists. And basically the meeting was about this question. How do we leverage the sympathy that we're getting now because of AIDS in order to cause people to look at us as an oppressed minority group so that we can then move forward in demanding special rights. Um, Kirk and Matson came up with a propaganda strategy in order to do just that. They wrote the book after the ball in order to outline the propaganda strategy. And if you read it, it reads like something that was written in retrospect about what happened, but it wasn't. It was the strategy that was proposed and then executed flawlessly in order to change the way people view homosexuality and to brainwash our young people. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and that's part of it. This whole idea of changing the way even Christians talk about the sin of homosexuality um, was part of it. Um, it's amazing. You know, pastors don't get up and apologize for preaching about it. You know, I, I'm going to preach a sermon on adultery today. Before I do, I want to say, listen, I have friends who are adulterers. All right. <laughs> I, I love adulterers. I do not believe that we ought to, you know, you know, we laugh because it just wouldn't happen. Yet you hear a sermon on homosexuality that doesn't begin like that, and it's shocking, right? Um, we, yeah, we've been co-opted. So, yeah, that, that, is, that, is, that is problematic. Yeah, here and then here. Yeah. Home education is the fastest growing segment in education in America. Um, and there are there are millions now uh, who are who are educating um, at home. And it's it's really changing the way we the, the way we educate. Um, it's being seen as more of a threat. Um, and so school districts are responding. Um, they have several like Trojan horse strategies that they use. Um, they're now offering 30 pieces of silver. Um, in the form of, you know, we'll do your grades, we'll give you a computer, you know, we'll do this and that and the other. Um, you know, all you have to do is sign up with us. And, you know, and then, by the way, the reason that they do this is because they get money per child. And if you sign up with their program, they get money for the child while you educate the child and they trade you a computer. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, that's happening because of the effectiveness of, of, of the movement. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it, it is happening. It is growing. Um, but here's what a lot of people don't realize. Only 49% of home educators are evangelicals in America. The majority of home educators in America are not evangelicals. Um, so it's not just people who, you know, are doing this for the reasons that we would think. Um, but, whole lot of other reasons that people are, are educating at, at home as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I spoke to it in the last message, you know. Um, that idea that the, the word abomination, she says that people who are saying that with the, the, the abomination word was lost in translation. There are two things. Number one, didn't happen. Number two, wouldn't matter, right? Because even if I'm not in Leviticus, I've got stronger arguments in the New Testament, right? So if you don't like Leviticus, let's go to Romans 1. So, you know, Romans 1 uses what I would argue is even stronger language 
against homosexuality um, than than what you find in Leviticus. So I I don't even play, I don't even play those games. The reason I'm going to this text is because I know that the most popular line of argumentation right now is the why do you pick and choose argument. And the reason it's so popular is because Christians don't know how to answer it, and they're being stumped, and it puts people in the morally superior position, you know, and so that's why I run there. Um, And then if people want to start, you know, dancing around there, um, then I go to other passages. But there's other things that we need to be aware of. For example, uh, Matthew Vines, um, his book, God and the Gay Christian, um, that is the newest line uh, an angle of attack. Um, and if you don't know Matthew Vines and you don't know, you know, God and the gay Christian, you need to, because this is what is infiltrating the church. Okay. So Matthew Vines is writing from a, a, a Bible believing, um, inerrantist conservative, uh, perspective and making arguments about homosexuality. And basically what Vines is arguing is that, when Paul's using the word homosexuality, he's talking about something that we're not talking about because Paul doesn't know about sexual orientation like we do. So they meant people who weren't like gay in their orientation, but just practicing uh, this cultural expression, heterosexuals who were engaging in this behavior. That's what is sinful. But people who are actually oriented toward homosexuality, that's not what they're talking about because they wouldn't have had even any understanding of that. And um, it's, you know, it's a sophisticated argument that he makes. Um, It's wicked. Um, It's very easy to see through. But if you are a 21-year-old Christian in a Christian college where you're being bombarded with, you know, you're out of touch, um, the problem is that we're not kind enough. Yeah, that's what's wrong. You know, that we, we, we're not kind enough. We're not loving enough. We're too judgmental, yada, yada, yada. And then, you know, you're kind of this outsider, fundamentalist, you know, narrow-minded bigot. And all of a sudden, Matthew Vines, you know, shows up and you read God and the Gay Christian and you have something that allows you to interpret the biblical texts with a little sleight of hand so that you can simultaneously say, I believe the Bible and say, I'm with the culture on this issue, man, that's a huge relief. And there are lots of Christians who are going down that road. Um, So the Matthew Vines line of argumentation, it's slick um, and, and, and it is absolutely gaining headway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's very interesting. I um one of the things that I talk about in expository apologetics is how I use social media as kind of a petri dish. Um and I I I put things out there um oftentimes just to see kind of where the response is. And one of the things that I predicted was, you know, all this stuff on same sex marriage um, there would be hue and cry. It would last for a week or two. And then what would happen is people would basically say, time to move on. So I post a lot of stuff about the se- sexual ethics. And I get from people, hey, where's the gospel, man? Your site ought to be about the gospel. We don't need to be told what people are doing out there. We know what's happening out there. We know what's... Now, some of these same people, when all of this was going on, were like, where are the pastors? How come the pastors weren't informing people? Why weren't the pastors preaching on this? How did all of this happen? And we didn't even know it was happening because the pastors, the pastors, the pastors... And now they're going, dude, pastor, why, why are you talking about this stuff? So there is apathy. We have moved on. Um, and, and this is actually going to be the new divorce and remarriage. Here's what I mean by that. You go back 100 years ago, and the overwhelming majority of people were in one of two positions. 
either they were a one clause person or a no clause person. In other words, divorce and remarriage only in the case of unrepented adultery or no divorce, no remarriage under any circumstances. hundred years ago, that was the positions that churches took. They did not accept it. It just wasn't, it, it was stigmatized. Well, you get California no fault divorce and now there are very few churches that will actually oppose any divorce for any reason. And basically, most evangelicals have to position divorce is completely acceptable for any reason. And anyone who would hold to that divorce could be unbiblical under any circumstances is basically marginalized, right? That's what's going to happen on homosexuality. We will go from this position where, you know, a few decades ago, evangelicalism would have been united and there would have been some outliers, right, who would have been kind of on that pro-homosexual, Matthew Vines, whatever. But within the next 20 to 40 years, the conservative, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible means on homosexuality, is going to be marginalized and it's going to be a small sliver of the Christian community in America that will dare to hold that position. And the overwhelming majority will fully embrace homosexuality. That's where we're going. That's what we're seeing. And now it's taking the form of apathy. Why are you talking about that? You know, that ship is sailed. You know, we're beyond that. You know, um, so... Um, question is, you know, living in Africa, living in Zambia, um, things that shape culture, especially youth culture there. Um, yeah, television and movies are, are, are very popular, um, there just to shape the culture. Um, yeah, but not just American television. Um, there's a much broader influence, um, in that, that part of the world from, uh, you know, other kinds of television. The notorious TV where we are is Nigerian TV. Yeah, that's the notorious, lewd, lascivious, you know, kind of, yeah, oh, the Nigerian shows. Well, you watch those Nigerian shows. Um, so, yeah, there's more than just um, American influence there. It's a big British influence. Um, again, I'm, we're in Zambia. It was a British colony. So, you know, the BBC um, is much more influential um, there. But, but yeah, definitely American television and movies. Um, but, but beyond that, just, you know, that medium in general um, and, and, and the Internet, and, you know, those are, those are very powerful um, shaping influences for young people. Yeah. Do I ever get to debate anybody on cultural issues all the time? No, <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, I've never filmed any, no, uh-uh, yes. Yeah, um, you read that within the context of the entire New Testament. You ask yourself, okay, was, is that intended to mean that Christians should not involve themselves in moral issues beyond the church? Um, there's several issues that would negate that reading of the text. One, for example, would be John, John the Baptist. Why was he beheaded? because he confronted Herod, a political figure, on a sexual morality issue because he took his brother's wife, right? So either 
that was sinful or we're misreading 1 Corinthians 5. Another issue is Romans 13. Romans 13 makes it very clear that the government has a duty and responsibility to function as God's minister and to uphold what God says is good and right and to oppose and punish what God says is evil. That's the government's duty and responsibility. So I think Christians' ignorance on political philosophy is costing us a great deal. This is why when people are like, you know, we've got to get the Christians to go vote. Like, yeah, you're missing a step, man. Most Christians don't have a biblical worldview. So if you get the Christians to go vote, they're going to vote badly. Right? First, you got to teach them political philosophy from a biblical perspective. Then you get them to go vote. Right now, I, I want most Christians not to vote. Because they do it badly. Right? Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, we're, we're, we're not approaching a new reformation because the old one still hasn't ended. Um, and it's vibrant um, and, and beautiful and wonderful. Um, you know, just, just, just look at things that are being published right now, uh, preachers who are being listened to right now. Um, we're, 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 we're in the midst of that. So right alongside all of this health, wealth, prosperity, mumbo jumbo, um, that's also going through multiple iterations and changing and rising and falling and all that. You know, right alongside that, there is um, this, this wonderful um, revival of Reformation theology, um, unlike anything that's been seen in a long time. Um, and it's good, man. It's good. So... It's happening. It's happening. The revolution will not be televised. All right. But it's happening. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes, the Islamization of Europe. Our apologetic Christian leader in this country. Oh, man, you call him Obama. I'm like, we got a Christian leader in this country? Um, so, I'm like, what, what Christian leader are you talking about? You talking about your president. You talking about your president, yeah. I live in Zambia. I live in Zambia, man. That's your president now, okay? Um, so, so, oh, boy. Yeah, I, you know, I think... I think really the we don't learn lessons from history, right? The, the whole Neville Chamberlain capitulating, right? We don't learn, man. And so now what are we doing? We're capitulating. We just be nice to these folks. Anybody who believes that doesn't understand radical Islam, Right? I mean, that, so, or they do understand. Well, anyway, um, so, but, but yeah, that's, it's, it's hugely problematic and we have a great deal of historical ignorance um, and, you know, political tone deafness and a bunch of other stuff, you know, going on and just cowardice, you know? Um, and it's sad. Makes me sad, man. Makes me sad. Yes, here, and then we'll go back there. Yeah. Do we think? Do I think we need to firm up the word Christian? And and it's interesting how historically um, people have have done that um, because it was Christian, and then it was born again Christian, and then it was evangelical, and then it's fundamental, you know. And it's always something. And and now you know, I always hear people say things like, you know, like like. Um, in, this, in the sports world, because we're always, you know, really interested in which 
sporting figures are Christians, you know. And it's not a Christian. Oh, really? He's a strong Christian, you know. He's a sold out Christian. He's a, you know, we've always got to, you know, adjectivize it, to make up a word, um, just because the word doesn't mean anything, you know. Um, but that, that's always been the case, man. That, that's always been the case where we've had to be very clear about what it means to be a follower of Christ, um, you know. But it just gives us more opportunity to proclaim the gospel, you know, more opportunity to double back and say what we mean by what we say. Um, and if we find another word, then eventually we'll, you know, have issues with that as well. I mean, it just happens. You know? yeah, all the way in the back and then, yeah. Yes, all the way in the back, yeah. Ah, no, good. Um, yeah, we have to be concerned about politics because politics is concerned about us. That's pithy enough for you. Um, and the other thing is this, there is, <laughs> the, the idea that we would leave the governing of nations to people who don't know God and think that that would put us in a better position is ridiculous. Especially when historically God has always judged nations. And he judges them for their obedience or lack thereof to him. It's so foolish, all these Christians, you know what? Well, if, if the government doesn't claim to be Christian, then they can't be held to a Christian. Do you read your Bible? Have you read Revelation? If you believe that, then what you believe is when the end comes that, you know, God's not going to judge the whore of Babylon. Why? Well, she's not claiming to be his. Right? The only people who could be judged are the people who say, okay, God, we agree. Do you follow? That makes no sense whatsoever. But a large percentage of Christians actually talk like that. Like you can't hold the government to a biblical standard because the government hasn't agreed to be held to a biblical standard. You don't have to agree. God is not running for God. <laughs> it's not, you know, okay, you vote for me, then I'll judge you. That, no. Everyone, nations will be judged. All nations will be judged, right? And if that's true, then those of us who know what God requires um, must speak up, right? We can't, we can't, just, be, we can't just be silent, Um and according to 2 Corinthians 10.5, we, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Politics is a thought, right? So even it must be taken captive to obey Christ. So, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I was born violent. Right? I was born violent. So I found football. So I could be violent and not get in trouble. But 
if I'm violent toward someone, I don't get to say, well, I, that's, I, was, I was born like that. Right? We're, we're born attracted to the opposite sex. Well, but when you get married, you don't get to say, well, yeah, but I was born like that. I was there. She was there. It, right? Um, that, that's never been, it's never been an excuse. It's never been acceptable. Um, yeah. In this book, by the way, um, and by the way, this book is hard to get, hard to find. When you find them, they're incredibly expensive. Um, this after the ball, um, book, um, but you can find and you can find the article that they wrote that they published, I think, in 88 uh, before the book came out in 89. Kirk and Madsen. Um, they wrote an article that's basically a, a summary of the book. Um, one of the things that they do is is they rec- they recognize the fact that there's no evidence um, that people are born uh, homosexual, um, that the studies that claim to prove it don't prove it. Um, and that's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, they also talk about this mantra that they need to use one in 10, one in 10, one in 10. Um, they knew that only between one and 3% of the population was, uh, practiced homosexuality. Uh, but this mantra one in 10, one in 10, um, and their whole idea behind the mantra was we have to make people understand that it's just the luck of the draw, you know, one in one in 10 people are, are gay. Now we know that that number doesn't mean anything, but if you repeat it often enough, people will believe it. And so we have to keep repeating it. Um, and it's amazing how much of this stuff just like takes hold. Um, there are people who actually believe that science has found a link, um, to, you know, genetics and homosexuality. You know, well, this study, the twin study, the pheromone study, the this study, the that study, part of the reason that they believe that is because the news media, when these studies come out, you know, they give this, you know, fantastic headline, um, but they don't give you, um, like, the abstract or the delimitations of the study, which basically say, this was our thesis, and we didn't prove it, but... It would have been awesome. Um, they just go, hey, scientists find a link between, you know. Um, so anyway. It, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Ethnic Gnosticism, yes. That's my word, man. I made up that word. <laughs> Remind people, all right? Remind people, that's my word. Okay, okay, yes. Can I move back from prison? <laughs> no. Um, so, ethnic Gnosticism is a term that I coined. Um, basically, he, what we've done is we've reduced everyone to constituencies, groups, and especially ethnic groups. And what we do within these ethnic groups is we claim that the only way that you could really ever understand our plight is to be one of us. What that allows us to do is say things that make absolutely no sense, that aren't true, um, that are complete fabrications, and when somebody calls us on it, we can say, of course you think that, because you're a racist. I know, right? You, you don't know. And so, example of ethnic, ethnic Gnosticism. You know, we go into a restaurant, and um, I sit there, and it takes a long time for somebody to come to my table. Well, I know why that happened, right? And you sit there and you go, well, come on, man. There's a lot of people around here, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of, yeah, of course, you think that. See, 
What is Gnosticism? The Gnostics believed that they understood things because of a special revelation that they had that other people didn't have access to. Ethnic Gnosticism is just, no, I, I have radar for these things. You don't, you don't have it. That's too bad for you, but I do. And when I tell you that that's what's happening, you don't get to question me. In fact, if you do, then you're compounding the assault against me. And what this does is it makes me unassailable. And it makes me unaccountable. It's powerful. It's huge, man. That's ethnic Gnosticism. Um, the question was, speak to the, the issue of churches becoming overly political. You know, when we become overly political is when we rely on politics. Um, there's a difference between understanding politics, um, thinking about politics from a biblical perspective, right? And then relying on politics. Uh, perfect example is the religious right. Right back in the 1980s, moral majority, so on and so forth. Right, um, uh, example of this, you know, moral majority um, becomes a political player, and now all of a sudden they wield political power. And when you're a political player and you wield political power, you get a seat at the table. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get Ronald Reagan elected. <coughs> Ronald Reagan gives us a Supreme Court justice who ends up being one of the worst liberals that we've ever had on the court. And conservatives knew it at the time. But the decision was made not to confront him on it because he's our guy. Let's trust him. That's when you lose your prophetic voice. When you're a player, you're on a team, and you've got to close your mouth so that you can help your team stay strengthened and you don't bust the chops of the person who you said a while ago was greatest thing since sliced bread because now you're a player. That's when you're over politicized, you know? Um, and, and that happens often. It happens frequently. You know, we're so tied to a party that you can't criticize uh, the party. Um, and that's where we are. It's interesting because you know, I've, I, I will often say things or post things about a person on this side and a person on that side. And if you post something over here about a person on this side, you're saying that something's negative, something's wrong. The immediate assumption is, wait a minute, you're for that person? Why? Well, because anybody who says something negative about this person must be for that person. Well, I actually kind of like this guy, but he's wrong on this. Well, you can't do that. That's when you're over-politicized, right? That's when you're over-politicized, you know? And you, you can't, like, somebody does something well, and you go, hey, that person did that. Well, you're for that person? No, I'm actually against them. Don't like them at all. But that's pretty cool. No, you can't do that. You can't say that they did something well or they did something right because they're not your party. They're not your guy. They're not your... See, that's when we're over-politicized. So it's not so much about our, our activity, so to speak. I mean, it could be, but it's about our perspective, you know? And when we lose our prophetic voice, and when we're no longer saying to Herod, it's wrong for you to have your sister's wife, because we've kind of agreed with him, and he's given us a seat at the table, and now we have our, you know, religious initiative, and we're getting some money over here, and with shekels come shackles, so... We don't necessarily like what you're doing with your brother's wife, but we really like the power that we have over here. So privately, we'll talk about it, but publicly, we're going to leave you alone. That's when you're that's when you're over politicized. Um, the question is: Can I speak a little bit about the family and raising godly children and being an influence for our? grandchildren, and, you know, that's another conference, but I can do that one too real quick. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, there, were, there was a, a trilogy of books. I told you about this before. Um, and I, I had written 
the ever loving truth and then the ever loving truth Bible study and, you know, kind of doing the whole apologetics deal. Then I wrote um, family driven faith. And it was very interesting, you know, dealing with family driven faith and publishers because publishers were kind of going, yeah, writing this book on the family. Help me understand that. Cause you know, you're not a, psychologist, you're not a family therapist, you're kind of, you know, da, da, da. and I, I just, I, I realize there's something wrong here, you know, I'm like, no, but I'm a Bible teacher. I'm a pastor and pastors, theologians, and Bible teachers have addressed, have always addressed this issue. All of a sudden we'd come into a place where the only people who have the right or the authority or the clout to address these issues are people who've been trained in the quasi science, the anti biblical quasi science of psychology. Well, that's hugely problematic. And so I didn't just write the one book, I wrote three, you know? Um, you know, just to address it from a biblical, theological, pastoral, cultural, apologetic perspective. Um, because it is, like we started, you know, that's kind of where we started. This is where the attack is focused, um, you know, the, and it's been like that since the garden. Um, the attack has always been focused on the family, um, on destroying this this picture of the relationship between Christ and his church, this theological picture of the triune God. Um, so it, it's ironic that um, the enemy understands that, you know, faith is transferred multi-generationally and that we have a huge duty, responsibility, and privilege to raise, train, and disciple our children, you know, find it in Ephesians chapter 6, um, but but we we don't think of it that way, you know, or we haven't thought of it that way in a while. Um, but just like with the brother's question back here, um, I'm delighted to say that there's also a huge um, revival of, of, uh, of sorts going on in that regard, too. Our understanding of our roles and our responsibilities as husbands and fathers and wives and mothers and, you know, parents discipling our children, and raising them up, bringing them up in discipline and instruction to the Lord. Um, and we've also had a slew of very good material um, to come out um, ab- about that as well. So, and um, I, I hope that by God's grace, I've been able to contribute to that. Um, so, yes, here and in there. And then I think we're about, we're about out of time, but we'll go here and we'll but I love this. I can do this all day. Y'all. I'm just like, yes. Yeah. 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 Again, the, the homosexuals always, and you find this in after the ball. You can't let them argue the slippery slope. This is this was their position. You know, we're not arguing for these other things. We're not asking for these other things. We're just talking about us. We're not talking about that. And um <laughs> but when you're talking about the law, there's this little thing called precedent. Right? And when courts make decisions, They establish precedent. And in order to understand the implications of that, um, you've got to understand how that precedent will likely be applied in the future. And it did not take a rocket scientist or even a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. Um, But I can read and when people are making these decisions and when they're making these decisions based on the idea that this is equivalent to ethnicity, one plus one equals two. This is going to have to impact the way we look at that. It's going to have to impact the way we look at that. It's going to have to impact the way we look at that. And the homosexuals, I mean, they were well-trained and disciplined. We're not asking about that. We're not talking about polygamy. We're not talking about, you know, polyamory. We're not talking about pedophilia. Now, why are you, that's not, I'm just talking about me as a human being and my rights to love whoever I want to love and da, 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 you know, that, that, and we let them do it. 
We let him do it. And now the horse is out of the barn. Um, and we've established precedent. And there's a lot more stuff to come, man. There's a lot more stuff to come. And we haven't even, there's stuff we haven't even imagined. In Australia, um, for example, Pastor and I were talking about this earlier. In Australia, there's a member of the parliament there who's arguing for um, getting rid of incest laws. Um, but why? Well, because the only reason that we have our incest laws is because of birth defects. Well, now we have prenatal testing and abortion on demand. If we have prenatal testing, we can find the defects. We have abortion on demand. We can abort childs with birth defects. Therefore, since we can remove the only consequence that was the reason for us not to have incest, we should remove our laws against incest. Well, small problem. If you read Leviticus 17, you see that the incest laws go far beyond um, the idea of people being related to each other by blood. There's incest laws that concern people who are not related to you by blood because incest is not about birth defects. But, you know, if you're ignorant of that, there's just no end, man. There's just, there's just no end. Um, but, the, you know, the, the upside of that, of course, is when this thing spins so far out of control and it gets so ridiculous, um, oftentimes that's the moment when people say, you know what, the wheels have fallen off. We need to go back to the drawing board. There has to be a moral standard. We messed up, you know. So, all right, here, finish this up. Oh, no, they're not trying, bro. That's, that's what they did. They done done it. That's done. Um, the, the question is, they, they equated sexual orientation with ethnicity. You know, can I walk you through um, how, to, how to respond to that? Um, yes, I can walk you through how to respond to that. There's a couple of things. Um, here's the way I love to respond to that. It just messes people up. Um, I can prove that I'm black. You can't prove that you're gay. Here's why that's problematic. We're saying that someone has standing in a legal matter, and we can't even prove that they belong to the group that they say they belong to. You can prove who you've had sex with, but you can't prove that you are something that you can't even prove exists. We know there's homosexuality, but we don't know that there are homosexuals. Somebody says, I am a homosexual. No, you're not. Well, yes, I am. Prove it. Well, I have sex with these people. That, so? So? That proves what you do. It doesn't prove what you are. Prove what you are. I can prove that I'm a black person. You can't prove, number one, that you are a homosexual, and you can't prove that there is such a thing because there are people who've practiced that who no longer practice it. We know this from first Corinthians chapter six. We've got 2000 year old evidence that people stopped doing that, which means they weren't the thing. They just did the thing. We're talking about a group that doesn't even exist. And I think that that's part of where we have to go in order to address this matter. Because people have, you know, there are people who they said they were at this point in their life, and then they were. You, you ever heard the term lugs? It's a very popular term. 
Lesbian until graduation is what it stands for. Very common term. It's a very common phenomenon on college campuses. Women who, while they're in college, that's what they practice. That's how they live. After college, it's not. So are they the thing or did they just do the thing? And if you can't even prove, by the way, because what are you going to do, blood test? Right? We can't even prove that the thing exists. How can we therefore equate it with something that, number one, we know exists, number two, we can test for? I am black. I don't just say it. I can actually prove that I belong to the group that I say that I belong to. When it comes to homosexuality, that's not even possible. So there's problem number one. Problem number two, it's behavior and it's, you know, anyway. Um, there's more to that. I talk about it in expository apologetics, but start there. All right. It's after 12. We have, oh, yes. Okay. All right. Listen. Okay. Here's the, and, and it's a rule. It's a rule. And I don't know how many of you do, you know, much public speaking or anything like that, but it's like a rule. I don't know if it's written in a book or not. I think it's in the Bible, like the second hesitations or something like that. Um, second hesitations too. If you are closing up a conference and somebody does this, you got to let them ask, right? If it's, if, it's what, if it's one of these, like, oh, I'm so sorry, but I got to really, then you got to let them ask. And she did that. So she gets to be the last question. Harvard, yeah, after the ball, two Harvard professors, Russell Kirk and Hunter Madsen, one in psychology and one in marketing. Um, Russell Kirk, Hunter Madsen. And you can find their article uh, from 1988 where they basically outline the argument. Um, but it's a propaganda strategy, um, and they use the this three-step process of brainwashing. Um, and they're very clear um, about that. Um, again, if you got, uh, do we have any more? Are the DVDs all gone? The uh, the separate reformanda. There's a case of them out there. Okay, um, the DVD I I deal extensively with Kirk and Matson, and there are a lot of slides with their quotes on there, um, and it's. Yeah, it's 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 pretty it's pretty telling, um, and it is an amazing book. I, I I have a copy. It's hard to find. Um, it's out of print, and like I said, they're very expensive. I don't even know how I I got mine, uh, but it's it's a very important piece. But yeah, Kirk and Matson, their article from 1988. You can get that, and it'll basically give you kind of the overview of uh, of what became the book. In the book, they actually have samp they actually have sample ads for a TV campaign. Um, Cause one of the things that they said was we've got to use television and media. Um, and have you noticed that, you know, homosexual characters, they're always the smartest, the funniest, the best dressed, the, you know, always there's a reason for that. It was part of a campaign. Um, one of their campaigns for the Marlboro man, cause one of the things that they said they had to do was it's called jamming, right? This is one of the steps in brainwashing. So, you, you have to take images that people associate with positive things and associate that with homosexuality so that it kind of jams the re receptors in the person who's opposed to homosexuality. And you take images of negative things and associate that with people who are against it. So if you're against homosexuality, the image is the skinhead, the Nazi, you know, so on and so forth. And so they had this idea of presenting the Marlboro Man because if you can present the Marlboro Man as gay, then what are people going to do with that? Because that's the picture of masculinity. And that'll make people kind of go, ah, that, that just doesn't work. Well, that eventually became Brokeback Mountain. Yeah. So, all right.